Welcome to Force for Good and our series on the future of capitalism. Today we have a fascinating conversation to have with Petri Talas, who is the Secretary General of the World Meteorological Organization, the WMO. The WMO actually founded with the United Nations, the IPCC, the leading climate change institution in the world that is warning us of the consequences of not managing this transition uh, in the world and climate change uh, that is now facing us as an existential risk. We're going to have a fascinating conversation because Petri is an expert in this field. He has a long-standing career. He's from Finland originally and ran the equivalent of WMO in Finland. He joined the UN's, uh, UN Secretary General's Climate Committee too and is closely involved in all the strategies and policies that, that are now taking place as we look at how we cope with this major challenge facing all of us. Thank you, Petri, and I'm delighted to have you with us. Thank you. Petri, this is uh, such an important discussion and I want to kick off by asking you to summarize first, what is the role of the WMO? So we are the United Nations Specialized Agency on Weather, Climate and Water, and we are also the founding father of IPCC, which is providing scientific reports on the status of uh, climate and climate science. And uh, we are also dealing with the global observing systems, uh, weather, climate, uh, water and, and also greenhouse gases. And uh, we are providing reports on status of climate and we just published one here in COP28. Would you summarize how you see the impact on humanity of these changes? Once we established this IPCC, the first decision was made in '79. Uh, we, ha we have been showing that uh, that climate change will affect uh, human lives in various ways. It will affect the global economy, but it, it will affect uh, human beings growingly. Luckily, we have been able to uh, to see a decline in, in the amount of uh, human casualties uh, thanks to improved weather services. Uh, but the economic losses have been increasing eightfold uh, during the past uh, 50 years. So, so that's affecting people and, and we have uh, more and more challenges with our water resources. Uh, uh, we have started seeing more often uh, drought events. Uh, we have started seeing more often heat waves and also flooding. About the whole world has seen an increase of uh, heat waves. About half of the planet has seen, seen an increase of uh, flooding events and about one third of the planet has seen an increase of drought uh, events and, and sea level rise is, uh, is a, is, is a long-term threat for many, many island states but also for many big cities uh, around the world and, um, and, and, and then these mountain glaciers are melting at the higher and higher speed which means that we are getting less and less water to the, to the main rivers uh, in all continents and, uh, and, and we expect that by the end of this century most of the mountain glaciers will be totally gone. That's a shocking set of things to say, which it strikes me people have not fully digested. Why do you think that is? Why, why do people not appreciate this level of tragedy that will hit the world? I think that uh, what, what we have seen happening during the past 10 years, first the governments have realized that this is a problem because they have started seeing with their own eyes uh, the increase of uh, disasters related to weather. And, uh, and, and uh, also what has been happening during the past uh, years is that we have started seeing more technological means to, 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 to limit the warming and, 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 and this wake up of the, of, the, of the private sector and the engineering com, uh, community has been also fairly encouraging from our perspective. There seems to be a divide in terms of where the impact will hit. Um, I took the time to go through the RPCC report, the long version, and um, if I were living in the north of the world, Perhaps I could take the view that the direct impact of climate will be predominantly felt in the south. And I could um, find that, of course, I have some heat waves and there will be some tragedies, but not of the level of the global south. And living in the north, maybe one could be a little bit complacent about this and think it's a problem of the south. Do you feel that is true? If you, if, you, if you look at the economic impact, uh, it, it's, it's clear that uh, low latitudes and southern hemisphere, it, it's, it's going to be hit uh, hardest. Uh, but in, in the north, uh, especially countries which are close to the Arctic area, uh, we, we, we will see at least double the global warming, even triple. And uh, that's going to have a big impact on, on biosphere and uh, also many uh, 
traditional ways of uh, living in those th those parts of the world. And, and since we have uh, this uh, interconnection of the economies worldwide, uh, there's con not, not going to be any, any, any winners because uh, if a large fraction of the world will suffer economically or, or even we will have more mi migration, then that's going to affect also the rest of the world. So there, there won't be any winners in this game. Your report is, uh, is an expert report drawn from experts all over the world. Would you explain the process of the IPCC report, how it comes together, how many people are involved, just in brief, so people understand the magnitude of the effort that is going in to collect this information? Yeah, so this end result of this, uh, this work is, has been that we have published uh, uh, typically three volumes of uh, something like 1,000 pages each, uh, and thereafter a summary for policy makers to, to, to summarize the, the findings. And this process is such that uh, it's a scientific process, so we are, we are first selecting the, the, the authors of those, uh, those parts uh, based on their scientific merits and there's, uh, there's a competition who can be the lead author and, uh, and, and who can be the, the contributing authors. And typically we have a thousand uh, world leading scientists who are, 1,000 who are compiling the reports and then the, there's typically 2,500 uh, scientists who are reviewing it the first and thereafter it's uh, after the scientific review where, where we get uh, typically 100,000 comments from the reviewers the, the final uh, report is uh, compiled and uh, then it's uh, it's, it's uh, sent to the governments and also the governments have a co chance to comment it and if there are scientifically va valid uh, arguments there may be some modifications to the reports but but usually the governments uh, approve the scientific facts. All this comes together and highlights all the consequences of our actions to us. If, if, I, if I take each major region of the world and ask you to comment a little bit on those. So if I'm in North America, what are the major impacts on North America? What one can expect? So in, in North America, uh, there has been already increase in the amount of heat waves, uh, especially the western part of, uh, of, of, of North America has been facing a severe drought uh, during recently and also severe uh, wildfires uh, in California and uh, in, uh, in Western Canada. And, uh, and, and also this uh, last summer, for example, we had uh, record-breaking wildfires in in eastern part of, of, of Canada. We have never seen such uh, wildfires. <coughs> and the fact that the, uh, all mountain glaciers are melting, uh, uh, that there's going to be less and less water in the main rivers, which have their origin from, from Rocky Mountains, and uh, and that's already happened. This water shortages in 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 western parts of uh, North America, they, they are already part of the ev everyday life. And in Mexico, uh, we have started seeing also increase of the tropical storms, and of course that's uh, that's also hitting hitting the Caribbean part of uh, of North America, and, and we have seen some 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 hurricanes. Uh, hitting even, even, even New York, for example. This Sandy was uh, hitting New York and, uh, and, and we, got, uh, uh, we got major damage because of the, of the, of the, of the flooding, flooding in, in southern Manhattan and, and uh, for example, some of the subway lines were closed for more than, more than a year and, and there was also major economic uh, damage. And, and this, is, this negative trend will continue until 2060s anyhow, and, and that means that uh, these uh, conditions will be more extreme. And if you look at the uh, agricultural conditions bo for both uh, North America and South America, the scenarios are such that, uh, that uh, the soil moisture will decrease, which is going to cause uh, challenges for the, for the agricultural production. Your report indicates that the food basket of America will actually dry up and will have to be moved to the North America. And, and the northern lands into Canada too. Is that correct? The growing season has been uh, g getting longer, and that's of course affecting countries like Canada. But uh, but then, more southern parts of of, of 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 the North America are getting drier, and that's that's what we already always see. So, but uh, but uh, globally, one can say that uh, the, the losses of uh, of agricultural capacity that because of climate change cannot be compensated with the increase at the, at the higher latitudes because the soil is not the most fertile and, 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 uh, and the solar radiation conditions uh, won't change there. 
And America has the largest capacity in terms of fertile land to feed the world, to feed itself and the world. This is a major industry. Um, and at a time when we will go from 8 billion people to 10 billion people by 2050, this sounds like a crisis. So worldwide, uh, one of my personal main uh, concerns is uh, how to feed the growing global population uh, with, uh, with, uh, in, in, in these changed climatic conditions where potentially we will have uh, difficulties in, 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 in provision of food productions for, 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 for this, this population. And we have major growth of population in Africa, which is already taking place, and we have seen also many parts of Asia, like Pakistan or Indonesia, where there has been fairly dramatic uh, growth of population, and that's, uh, that's, 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 that's a difficult equation. O also in I India that's going to be a major challenge. So the population has been growing and, 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 and at the same time the conditions are getting, getting more challenging. Let's come to Europe. So um, what should Europe worry about as these changes happen? In Europe, of course, uh, uh, this southern part of Europe has become drier and hotter. And, and, and we have already seen, for example, two summers with, uh, with record heat waves and, 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 uh, and, and, and drought. And, and that has also affected human health. Uh, for example, in 22 summer, we got uh, between 60 and 70,000 casualties in Europe because of heat waves. And gradually, uh, this Mediterranean regions are getting warmer and drier, which means that these uh, desert areas that we have had in so far in, in North Africa, they are, they are, they are moving northwards. And, and the conditions for agriculture and also conditions for tourism uh, industry are getting, getting more challenging. And, and if we continue to move east and we go to China in particular and Asia, what, what are the challenges that they should think about it? So this melting of the, of the Himalayan and also Central Asian uh, glaciers is, uh, is going to be one of the, one of the challenges. And uh, for example, 65% of the, of the freshwater resources in whole Central Asian region have their origins from, uh, uh, from the glaciers of Tajikistan, which are gradually uh, melting and, and finally disappearing. The same is true for the, for the Himalayan glaciers where we expect to see uh, melting and, and m many of the main rivers in, in both India, China, Vietnam, Bangladesh, uh, they have their origins from, from, from Himalayas and uh, once this glacier is melting, we are getting less and less water to the key, key rivers and that's going to uh, have lead to water shortages uh, for human beings, for agriculture and also for industries. And, and, uh, and in Asia, of course, the sea level rise is also one of the, one of the challenges uh, both in India, Bangladesh, Vietnam and China. Yes. Important economic areas are, 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 the, are in these low-lying areas and the sea level rise is, uh, is a threat and also increase of uh, tropical storms which are, which, are, which are going to hit uh, those areas. And particularly for China, I guess, the, the, the southern states of China have really driven their growth and been industrialized. And you're saying those will also be a threat Sure, and, and it's, a, it's the same for Vietnam, and it's the same for, 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 for Indonesia, for, for Thailand, and also southern parts of, uh, of India. And, and better if we take the global south, it, it seems from your report that they suffer the most in terms of the heat waves and in terms of the impact uh, of, of drought and desertification and so on. Uh, and that would lead to a massive displacement of people too, right, across the global south. That's true, and, and if you look at uh, this from economic perspective, uh, <coughs> we have learned that uh, in, in, in island states we have seen uh, GDP losses of several hundreds of persons. Uh, the record may be Dominica 2017 when they lost 800 percent of their GDP after a hurricane hit. And in, in, uh, in African countries we have seen GDP uh, drops of the order of 10 to 20 percent uh, after flooding or drought. Uh, Route uh, events and uh, and, and uh, in, in richest countries only a few percentage losses. So this, in relative terms, uh, economies are hit uh, hardest. And uh, of course, in Africa, uh, this population growth uh, and uh, and their dependence on, on, on agriculture as, as a source of uh, 
of welfare and economy, uh, that's, that's, that's a difficult equation. So uh, we are ex expecting to see more challenges with agriculture and, uh, and again, again, how to feed the growing population and how to, how to ensure employment for the, for the young people and uh, also, of course, other services, uh, healthcare and uh, education. That's, that's not an easy equation. I, I think you're painting a very stark picture and very clearly. And um, I, I would like to briefly look at uh, a constituency that we collect lots of information about, we analyse and we publish reports on, include the largest institutions in the world, we look at the top 125, of which 30 are actively involved with us in some way. And we look at the top 100 technology companies in the world too. Um, is it your sense that the people you engage with sometimes from these sorts of organisations, at the level of the climate officer, the sustainability officer, they understand these issues. Um, and clearly that's communicated in their organisation to the most senior levels. And they have an appreciation too. But it strikes me the actions we're taking might indicate that people don't really believe or understand what will happen to their financial assets if this transpires, that that has not been fully processed into their plans and their planning scenarios. What do you think? Uh, for example, if we read these uh, reports of the World Economic Forum, also for this year, 23, uh, they have clearly demonstrated that the biggest threat for the global economy are related to climate change. Number one th risk is uh, failure of climate mitigation. Number two is, uh, is failure in climate adaptation. Number three is a growing amount of uh, natural disasters caused by climate change. <clears throat> so these are not only matters of comfort, but they are also matters of, of economy and, uh, and, and it should be also clearly understood that, uh, for example, these uh, fossil business related assets uh, may lose their, their, their value because of this transition. And if you read the most recent report of uh, International e e Energy Agency, for example, they have been surprised how quickly this, uh, this energy conversion out of fossil fuels towards renewables, uh, hydropower, uh, nuclear is going to going to happen and, uh, and, and that means that these fossil assets uh, are, are, are risky business uh, uh, for the, uh, in, in, even in the near future. And if I, if I look at the research that my team have done on this, reading your report, um, they point to uh, serious few security issues in North America, Europe and Asia, as you highlighted too. Um, serious health and mental well-being challenges, infectious diseases you know, and so on. Um, write downs in real estate and in infrastructure too, which are big investments today, um, and uh, a resilience investment needed, almost as if we are about to experience multiple pandemic shocks, uh, and that's what we should expect, almost a cycle of multiple shocks, equivalent to the pandemic we just went through, that would keep happening. And in the southern neighbours, they point to some extreme scenarios affecting animal and livestock, agriculture, fisheries, right down also in real estate infrastructure and food security um, and in Africa in particular water shortages and flooding uh, and increases in systemic poverty and poverty levels generally. Um, I mean we're a tough species we could adapt to almost anything but why would we have to if we plan for it and, if, and do you believe there are actions to take that we can actually make a difference to, to the 1.5C target or to make the planet safer? Actually, we have started acting and, and we, are, we are lucky that we have also technological means and even financial means to be successful in this, uh, this game. Uh, in the 2014 IPCC report, uh, there was an estimation that we would be heading towards 3 to 5 degrees uh, warming and at the moment we are heading towards 2.5 to 3 degrees uh, Range. So something has happened already and, uh, and we have already plenty of countries which have been able to decrease their emissions uh, by applying uh, new technologies, uh, solar, wind, uh, hydropower te technologies and, uh, and also in, 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 in uh, car industry we have growing amount of electric vehicles on the market and, and, uh, and, and, and so we are moving in the right direction and, uh, and, 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 uh, and the future is not automatically going to be black and, and we are more or less talking about uh, different scales of grey and, and the light grey
future would be this 1.5, which is uh, still theoretically alive if we if we really speed up our, our transition of uh, energy systems and uh, transport uh, systems and certain industries. So and, and we have we have means for that. Ten years ago, we didn't have such means, and, and they were, or they were not uh, uh, from financial perspective attractive. But uh, what has been happening? During the past five years, for example, especially, is that the, the prices of solar and the wind energy they have been dropping under the prices of uh, fossil fuel e energy, and also more and more we are getting uh, electric vehicles on the market, and, and also their prices and the prices of batteries are are dropping, and and we also understand what kind of uh, food we should uh, eat to, to to reduce the methane methane emissions to eat less rice and uh, and and and, uh, and red meat and and also we know what is the component coming from deforestation so we have the means and understanding what needs to happen and uh, and but so far we are not heading towards 1.5 uh, but, but, so but but it's it, answers, it, but we're not moving at the scale and speed is that challenging? so we are we are moving and and uh, and we are just in the process to speed up our our, our, our transition so that's good news and if you read the most recent report of International Energy Agency, there's, uh, there's certain hope, but whether we will reach 1.5, that's going to be very challenging. Two degrees is, uh, is, uh, is something that we could, uh, we could reach much more easily and, uh, and uh, the, we should not lose the hope. And, and also if you look at the amount of people who are attending these COP meetings, like here in Dubai, we are almost 100,000 people. This is showing that uh, this kind of movement uh, is, is, is growing and, and there's growing amount of uh, sectors and players uh, in countries who are interested in being part of the part of the solution. So 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 there's some hope, I would say. It, it's good to hear something positive in terms of the story we, we've explored so far. Um, from a political perspective, um, there are scenarios that are outlined too, and I notice those scenarios don't often come to the fore in the discussions with, with the IPCC or the WMO. Or with policymakers, but you have these things you call the SSPs, and uh, there are five. There are five core scenarios I know that, that are often used. Um, at the two extremes, I see that one of them is that we go for green, and the other extreme that we go for broke or go for growth, and exploit fossil resources to to the extreme. And there are three scenarios in between, and each of those are a middle path that doesn't actually deliver. It doesn't deliver one point five. And the most scenarios don't deliver to either. Um, where do you feel we are on this spectrum of scenarios? So we are in the middle at, at, at the moment, and, uh, and 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 so we haven't, we are not heading towards this uh, worst case scenario an, anymore. And and we should also understand that this transition is a great business opportunity. I'm always using this kind of analog uh, analogy to uh, to the horse carriage uh, producers in New York. Uh, hundred years ago when they realized that there's a new thing called automobile on the market and they were concerned that what's going to happen to their business. And, and, and I'm quite convinced that this uh, fossil business will suffer and, and this kind of new technology business will boom. And that's what we should also understand that this transition is, uh, is not only a cost issue, but it's, it's also an opportunity. Which parts of the world do you think, which countries in the world are the most pushing the opportunity and see it as a great opportunity that this, this crisis is something to solve for and they believe they will create a better society at the end of it. So we have, uh, I would say that we have three areas where we have seen things happening. Europe has been of course driver of this, uh, this uh, emission controls and uh, Europe has done the best, uh, best job uh, so far. But if you look at these technological innovations uh, uh, for example, this U.S. Uh, Tesla company has been a game changer when it comes to car manufacturers, and, and that's that's very po profitable business. Uh, but uh, but uh, China has become the leading producer of uh, solar technology, uh, also wind technology, and and uh, they're the biggest manufacturers of uh, electric uh, vehicles at the moment. So so China will be one of the winners of this business, and and, and Europe. Uh, is, is also going to be benefiting from this transition and uh, and one, the, 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 the fossil energy that Europe has been buying from Russia or from the Arabic countries, we could use that uh, 
resource for more smartly in the future, and that, that kind of transition is un un underway. And also in the USA, uh, uh, these uh, car manufacturers and also the energy sector has started invest in investing in, in solar and wind technology. So things are happening and, uh, and also this er energy saving means, for example, in the city of New York, they have uh, changed their, their lighting, system, light, lighting system so that they, they have uh, installed uh, energy saving means and, and they gain the, the money back uh, in, in five years or so. So, so there are positive things happening in many, many, many continents. And I was recently visiting a couple of African countries, both Kenya and Ethiopia. And in both countries, more than 90% of the energy that they're producing is now, is, is now renewable. And, uh, and, uh, and, and so there are also, also these kind of encouraging examples uh, worldwide. So if, if you read the media, the stories are always a bit negative and, uh, and, and, and nobody reports of, of, about this uh, positive evolution that is going on worldwide. Quickly, one question on the second order impacts, and particularly migration. I pick migration because it's a political issue and it seems to be an issue at the heart of the most advanced democracies in the world. Talk about that, please. Today. So we have, uh, I would say, double challenge there. We have uh, one challenge which is related to the fact that the climatic conditions are getting more challenging, especially at the low latitude areas and, and places like Africa. And then we have this population growth uh, challenge that it's, it's difficult for the young people to get uh, employment and, uh, and, and education and so forth. And, and they are seeking for better life uh, outside of their home, home countries. And uh, this has already had an impact on, on, on the Western democracies. Uh, uh, in, in the USA, this, is, this, is, this has been a theme of President Trump, uh, in many European countries, uh, there have been uh, a transition from from the moderate parties towards uh, extreme right parties who are uh, who are against immigration. And uh, so, this is not only only a matter of uh, people moving to other countries, but it's, it has it had, had, an, had an impact on on policies and, uh, and and in some countries even on their their climate policies. So some, sometimes those. Uh, parties are not so eager to promote uh, climate mitigation and, and we have seen that uh, happening also in North American countries, Australia and, uh, and European countries. So this is having an impact on democracy and uh, that's something that also, also to keep in mind. So, so failure to address, cl address climate change will not lead to, as the UN says, a billion people migrating into Europe or into the US or into other parts of the North. But it just takes a few hundred thousand to enter a country and for that country to fill the threat and for ordinary people to start to vote more and more right. And those, as they vote more and more towards the far right, it seems as if um, those parties do not have the policies to pursue climate change with the vigor um, that is required to actually make it for a more peaceful world and deliver human security for all. Is that correct? That, that's, that, that, that's right. And, and that has been happening to a certain degree. So. Uh, for example, this interest to build a fence against the Mexican border in in USA and, and also in Europe, we have seen such, uh, such, uh, such transitions taking place. And it seems as if fences do not keep out people as effectively as people thought in all parts of the world. Yeah. And somehow there has to be better solutions. Exactly. And of course, we have to tackle also this population growth challenge, which is uh, also affecting cl uh, climate uh, change it, we, we will see more victims of climate change, but we will see also more, more potential consumers. Uh, so, so also this population growth is, uh, is an issue that we should talk about. It's a profound challenge to our way of life and, uh, and demonstrates our interdependence here. Yeah. As we come to a close, uh, um, what are the biggest barriers that you see to making this change? Are they political? Uh, but are they to do with uh, people really not wanting to change? Um, are they technological? Uh, what are they? What sort of challenge do you, barriers do you see that need to be overcome? Of course, in this game we have, uh, we have winners and losers, and, 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 and it's, it's difficult for those uh, players who, whose business is related to fossil, fossil energy and sources of fossil, fossil fuels uh, to give up their 
their business. So that that's clear, and and this transition is not very easy for 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 for, for, for such uh, such countries and such uh, such companies. And but that at the same time, we see these winners, and uh, and and of course, uh, finally the winner is going to be the whole whole planet and whole mankind. That's a really positive note. And um, as an individual, and I'm delighted we're here at COP having this discussion, as you say, there is a there is a, a buzz of so many people trying to find answers. One of our partners, uh, the World Academy of Art and Science, uh, is working with the UN on, a, on an initiative called Human Security for All. Do you see us arriving at human security for all through the endeavours we're making? Are you positive about that? Let's, let's hope so. I hope so too. And uh, I'm delighted you spoke with us about this and you've highlighted some of the challenges and issues that we all face. Uh, thank you very much. You're welcome. It's a pleasure.